Welcome to Manwa Recaps, spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. The Manwa starts by introducing us to the Antares Empire, the capital Reifenheim. We hear the roars of a monster as it stomps on some soldiers. The battlefield has a few of these beasts. Then we hear a man saying their army of two million was defeated by the demons. While the demon king brought ruin to their nation and painted the world with evil, it shall be overwritten here and now. The demon king will die today at the hero's hands. In the palace of gay Iraq we see a hero called Alex von Hallen. Saying that it's time to return to the dark evil king. We're introduced to the demon king Reifenhart Wald Antares. The sword Saint Cyrus readies his blade saying this will be the end. Reifenhart asks why they are calling it an evil empire, when the name is Antares, and how the sun rises here too. The martial king Teslon, yells saying that he raises demons here and when he's gone the demonic nature will be too. Reifenhart says that he only taught them human tactics. He taught them how to retaliate yet they are being treated like demons. Reifenhart then asks if they've defeated the four heavenly kings, Cyrus says those demons weren't able to handle his sword, Reifenhart asks if the great warrior Tathet is dead. He says even if orcs look barbaric they are a species of hunter-gatherers, yet are treated inhumanely. Teslon laughs, saying they also dealt with the troll. Reifenhart is surprised Athelka is dead too, and says he looked mean but was nice. The saintess Ellen says they've also defeated the evil dwarf. Reifenhart facepalm saying that Michelin was just a dwarf, and the humans are so ignorant. The Mage of Light Jade also tells him they've killed the Dark Elf too. Reifenhart gets angry thinking of her, he says they are begging to die for killing Cerise. Teslon says he's finally showing his true colors, and the Dark Elf fell to the dark side, and they have no pity to monsters. Reifenhart says just because her skin was darker doesn't mean she was evil, it's because they cut down all the trees she had to evacuate to barren lands. She was a pure-blood high elf, and just happened to be tan. The heroes all ready themselves, Alex says he'll avenge the dead with his sword. Reifenhart asks who will avenge the other species then. Alex says that's despicable, and if it weren't for Reifenhart then the other species. Reifenhart says they won't listen at all and begins to release his aura, he explains how the other species want nothing more than to not live as slaves, and just for that they think they are worth killing. He says he'll become the king they think of him as if this is how they want it to be. He launches them into the air with his magic, and he's crying while explaining he was just a normal great mage. He prepares some high-level magic, while explaining how humans are racist. They see other species as nothing but pure evil who are slaves. But he got to know them, see how deep their culture was, he even learned spiritual magic from the elves and sorcery from the trolls. By utilizing both of these he became the first 10 circle mage in history. He could no longer idly sit and watch, but it became harder to trick the humans as his territory grew. So the humans began to send knights to raid them. This caused them to flee elsewhere, and it repeated over and over. But they started to fight back and began increasing their size while taking land. Eventually it became the Antares Empire, he didn't make it out of hate for humans. He just believes the other species weren't inferior to humans. They didn't carry out any retaliation against the humans, and this was the outcome. The civilization was attacked, he understands that the humans fear them, but he finds it unacceptable that they'd kill his people. He tells the heroes he has a duty to protect his empire, he hits Alex sending him rolling away. And he mocks him, saying he was just a hero in name. Heroes only survive to the end in stories, in reality they just die early. I guess the rest got off-screened, as the only one left is Teslon, who is hella strong. The rest are weak, but this man is different. He rushes in at Reifenhart, and punches the ground in front of him. This destroys a huge section of the palace, and causes him to distance himself. We see an explosion from the side of the palace, and Reifenhart lands outside of it. Then looks up to see that Teslon is coming in hot with the people's elbow. He puts up a barrier, but Teslon says he's won this and turns Reifenhart into a Goomba, who then bluffs asking if that's all. Because in reality, his spine is broken and he realizes he cannot win. Teslon starts to walk at him, and Reifenhart says yes he won. Teslon says this will free the rest from their demonic restraints. Reifenhart grits his teeth, saying he will not give up. Since it means his people will turn back into slaves. He pulls out an artifact, saying it's the eye of time and space, and that he a tenth circle cannot even decipher it. Teslon asks what he's trying to do. Reifenhart says it's a time and space regression spell, that will turn back time. He begins to activate it, and says that he doesn't know if it'll work or not. Teslon leaps directly at him, but the spell is about to finish, neither of them give up. 
Teslon's punch goes through the magic, and they both scream as a massive shockwave is sent out. A bright light forms from their collision, and then explodes and sends out a massive light. Then it jumps to a forest, inside of it is a log cabin, and Reifenhardt says he feels warm and opens his eyes. He's surprised he succeeded saying he didn't even know it would work, he wonders where he is. Saying he doesn't remember a place like this in the past, and he wonders how old he's supposed to be right now, he gets out of bed, saying his physique looks great, but he looks in a mirror asking who the hell he is. He says there's too much muscle and it's gross, and a mage doesn't need any of this. Then he humble brags about how he used to sweep ladies off their feet when he was young, and when he got older he pulled elves. He wonders why his face looks so dumb compared to back then, and wonders why he's in some random guy's body, then he starts to recognize the face slowly but surely as he's inside Teslon's body. Plot convenience ensues, and we hear a man calling for Teslon. And a giant leans his head into the doorframe, saying the sun is up so why isn't he outside yet? And it's time to have a great day. Reef asks him who he is, and the man asks why he's looking at him like it's their first time meeting. Then the old man clicks his tongue saying he's already used the amnesia excuse twice. He palms his head like a basketball, saying it's time to go train. Reef says he was Teslon's teacher originally, and recognizes him as Gerard Chrome Protase. We see Reef tied to a tree, trying to explain it to Gerard. Gerard tells him to shut up, and he's talkative today. He grabs a piece of bamboo saying it's time to train, and then Reef grunts as we hear the sound of him being hit in the stomach. He begins to cry, and he wonders what the hell is going on. Then more strikes start to land on him, he says this is how he'll die. Gerard says he feels softer than before, and wonders if he actually has amnesia. But since their martial clan Jim Unbreakable is hardworking and they train like simple idiots he's also lost his memory in the past. He scoffs saying it's an easy solution. And says beating him up is the solution here. He says humans need to use weapons because they are weak, and they have to wear armor since their physiques are lacking. But they are all excuses, as martial artists train to overcome their weaknesses. And humans are like steel, the more they are hit the stronger they become. He says he's the student he chose, and he knows he has no physical limits. And he knows only a few can become stronger from this, but that's exactly why he picked him. He keeps beating him while yapping about nonsense. And Reef thinks about his past life, and we see him laying on the ground later in the day. And he sarcastically thanks Gerard for being so rough. After he heads back he gets into the tub, and he realizes that he's bathing in healing potion. He's heard the queen bathes in milk, but that's nothing compared to this. He asks Gerard what's exactly in this bath. Gerard says you need to cool steel after hammering it. Reef realizes that this means the training session isn't just brutish, and it has some actual method behind it. Since he fought Teslon he knows how strong he is, and he's sure this training is the reason. He relaxes in the bath, and he wonders what's happening to his body right now. He wonders if the younger him even exists, and if two of the same souls exist at one time. Then he has two hypotheses. First that he coexists with the younger him, or that inside of his younger body is Teslon's soul. Then it jumps to Gerard saying to eat this plate of food, that he needs to have his nutrients replenished. Then it shows them lightly jogging, up a mountain. Gerard asks him if he's tired, or if they should continue their other training. Reef says no, and then he says he changed his mind and it's indeed just brutish training. We see him gassed out in bed, and hates the fact he's in this body. He wonders what influence it will have moving forward, and if he comes into contact with his younger self. He says he won't become a mage until 10 years from now, and he wonders what'll happen if Teslon took control of his body. There won't be much he can do with his body currently, but with the stage Teslon managed to get to, he might be able to do something. He says his priority right now is to run away, and starts hauling cheeks. He says no matter what he does tonight, he's running away. Gerard quickly asks where he's going. And says he was quiet for a month or two, but now he's running away again. He says this is the ninth time, Reef tries to tell him that he honestly isn't Teslon. Gerard laughs asking if that's his backstory this time, he said last time he came from another world, and before that he was an active master in Murim. But this time it's a bit convincing, so it's time to return and sleep. He gets grabbed by the head saying he'll succeed tomorrow. He failed today, but he won't live trapped here forever. He tries again, and Gerard stops him saying he tried it when he was young too. And again, this time finding him in water and drags him out of it. He eventually decides to give up on trying to escape. Gerard explains that in Jim Unbreakable there have been no disciples in the history of the gym to haven't tried to escape. 
Reef realizes even if he did then Gerard would track him down, so he just needs to officially get permission to leave. And just like that, we get a two-year time skip. And he's finally awakened as Aura. He recalls how even Cyrus was in his late 20s before getting Aura. Gerard says this is just the basics, and if your survival instinct is always driven to max you'll manifest Aura much sooner than expected. He says it's time to move on to the next step, Reef asks what training is next, and Gerard says it's going to be sparring. Reef is excited, then we hear him scream and boom another time skip of three years. Deeper into the mountains, we see a waterfall and Reef standing at the bottom of it. He begins to channel Aura into his fist. Saying it's called Calamity Horn, and after a bit of charging it begins to violently swirl and he readies his fist, punching straight into the side of the mountain. He wonders if the third stage is his limit. He explains how Calamity Horn is a skill where you channel all your strength into the attack, and the attack it leaves behind looks like a horn. He says he needs to reach the fourth stage. There are nine stages in total, and apparently the punch with nine ripples can kill even gods. Even the Teslon from his past life was only at the seventh stage. And Gerard was at the eighth. We learn he needs to be at the fourth stage at least to descend the mountain. He decides to just end his stamina training here for now, and begins to cast a magic spell, that is an air bullet. He launches it at a tree, barely leaving a mark on it. He scratches his head out of embarrassment saying he can't build his mana, so he doesn't know if he can even become a mage. Then he notices a presence, which isn't a human's. An orc appears, and says to pretend he didn't see him, and he won't hurt him. Reef says he's probably only three to four years old, I guess orcs age hella fast. He wonders if he escaped from somewhere. The orc says again to pretend he didn't see him. Reef says he seems like he's peaceful then asks if someone is chasing him. The orc is surprised he knows the orc language, and he says yes he is being chased. Reef says he wants to help, and asks if he'll trust him. The orc says he can feel he's genuine from his soul, but helping him will put him in trouble too. Reef says it's no problem, and to trust him, he begins to prepare another spell and puts it on the cave entrance, saying it'll conceal him. The orc is surprised he's a mage, since he's absolutely diced to the gills. The orc enters, saying he'll accept his kindness. Then Reef hears more footsteps, and a man asking if they really need to do all of this for a few silver coins. A man asks if he's seen a young orc pass by, and another offers a gold coin for the information. The original man says hell nah, and they start to talk about it. Reef cuts them off saying no. But they notice the orc's footsteps, and they say they just need to enter the cave. Reef says it's his dwelling, and he can't just let them in. The man barks at him, asking how dare a brat try to block their path. Saying there are over 10 of them. Then they realize he's absolutely juiced. Reef starts to recalls how Gerard told him his fists are too strong, so he summons a weapon since it's a mercy compared to his fist. Reef tells the soldiers if he hits them at least they won't die. They start to charge him asking if he's serious about this. Reef clenches his teeth then starts absolutely mogging these dudes. They decide to attack him as a group, but it doesn't matter. He keeps smacking them, saying there is no defense in Jim Unbreakable, only offense. One of them hit his back with their blade, but he quickly realizes he done goofed, he gets sent flying. Reef explains that the best part about the club is it won't kill them, so he can be ruthless as it's just making them crippled and brain damaged instead. Batman logic. They start to groan in pain, and the man asks for his name. Reef says it's not fair this guy is still fine, then hits him saying he needs to be injured like his friends. He eventually gets them to waddle away, and he says beating them up was fun, shame it's over. The orc comes out and thanks him, and says he will not forget this day, and bows his head. Reef asks if it's okay for a warrior to bow so easily, and the orc says he's his mentor and will wield his sword for him. Reef explains how an orc culture a mentor is someone they revere for life, it's like a knight serving their lord. The orc asks for his name, and he goes to say Teslon, but catches himself and introduces himself as Reifhart Wald Antares. The orc says he'll remember that name, Reef then asks where he plans to go, and the orc says anywhere he can rest. Reef tells him that there's a place the orcs call the Land of Trials and to go there, as the Blue Bear Orc tribe resides there. He starts to head out, and then Reef asks for his name. The orc says he is the son of Crota, and his name is Tathid. Reef is surprised and if you remember from earlier that was one of the four heavenly kings. He was the chief of the Blue Bear tribe. He wonders if Teslon met him in his original life, and says and looks like fate took a turn. He watches Tathid leaving, and he smiles saying it was really a fateful encounter. He starts to recall the four heavenly kings, and hopes that they can all meet again in this life. 
we get another time skip of half a year since his encounter with Tathad, and Gerard is going to hit him and launches an attack called Key Blast at him. Reef says that's too much, and blocks the attack using a spiral guard. Gerard tells him he did well blocking that, and he remembers a few years ago how he was saying his name wasn't Teslon. Reef asks why he needs to bring up something that was six years ago. Gerard says he's been teaching him for 10 years, but it's weird that he's still so small. And how everyone in Gym Unbreakable needs to be really tall. He asks him if he hasn't been using the breathing technique, Reef awkwardly looks away saying he doesn't want to be a giant. Gerard says it's fine if he's short, and to show him the results of his training. Reef readies himself, then opens his eyes then leaps into the air. He begins to activate Calamity Horn again, we see three rings form on his hand as he flies down, and he hits the earth and we see an additional ring forming, which means he's reached the fourth stage. The floor completely shatters, and creates a massive shockwave and erupts. Gerard watches all of this, and begins to laugh saying that is excellent. Reef is just surprised that he actually reached the fourth calamity. Gerard says it's time for him to head out to the outside world, and that he's done a good job. He even calls him Reifenheart, saying he can live life as he'd like. Whether it's good or evil, to live free. He laughs, saying that's the price of the training he's endured until now. Reef sweats and calls out to him. Gerard says he learned this from his master Rastel. First, it's fine to gain wealth just don't do it unjustly, and while it's okay to be a villain as long he has style it's fine. Gerard thought it was a weird rule, and Rastel says second to stand by those who are treated unjustly, so he can live a life of respect. Gerard asks why he needs to help the unjust, rather than the weak. Rastel says being weak doesn't mean they will be treated unjustly. After all the world is full of those weaker than him, so how does he plan to distinguish the weak? And the third most important one, make sure to continue the legacy of Jim Unbreakable. Gerard says he must find a disciple to inherit the teachings, and it's not an easy task to find a talented child. He tells him to just find the opportunity when it comes his way. He hands him some bags, saying it's his travel expenses and clothes. Reef is surprised at so little, saying he thought he had more wealth. Gerard laughs, saying they only offer 25 silver during his time. He hands him a map, saying he left a present here in the mountains. Feel free to visit if he happens to go in the area. It cuts to Reef about to descend, and he wonders if it's okay for him to do this. He wonders if he's actually free from this, then he sees an 8th stage calamity horn go off behind him, and it scares him. Gerard encourages him to leave, saying to run with an iron resolve, as he's the inheritor of the greatest teaching on earth. We see an inn, and inside people are saying it's dangerous. A knight asks what's the matter, the chief says he requests the man pay for the food the knights have eaten until now. The man calls him a peasant and flicks a coin saying it should be enough. The chief turns cross-eyed looking at it, then says this is nowhere close to what he needs. The knight hits him, saying he dares make a mockery of him. The village thinks that they are closer to bandits than they are knights. Another man asks the knight Edward what's going on. We learn the man is named Stefan, he says the villagers are despicable and it's why you don't pay mercy to peasants. Since they always seem to lose sense of their place, it cuts to Reef and Cerise laying in bed, and he asks why she's petting her. He asks her what's so nice about a thin body, and she says he's sharp and precise like a well-made blade. He's crying in the mirror saying his body is like this. But at least he is taller now, he says the Cerise of now would be 70, which is around 17 in human age. He's in South Chrome now, in the Vasili Kingdom. And Cerise gets sold next year at the Chattan Slave Auction, he wonders if he should just free her by force. But says he can't be reckless, and it's better to use money. The prices of slaves are absurdly high, and he's broke. But that's fine, since he possesses a strong body and memories of the future, and there should be an ancient rune on the way to Chatton. Plot convenience ensues, and we see Stefan asking a wizard named Todd if he's found the ancient ruins yet. Giga asks Chin starts to focus, and a bit later they both are looking at a mountain saying that's where the swordsman Claude is buried. It jumps again, and Reef is saying it's been three days since he left Chrome, and he's heading to the Hayton Mountains, he's surprised that he doesn't get cold. He used his artificial flashback skill, to remember the info on the ancient ruin and how Todd told him about it. He went in his past life too, and found the real treasure that Todd's party missed. He makes it to Cattle Village, saying it's just as he remembered. And we see the villagers having a discussion about the Valley of Death, and how a party demanded a guide take them there. A man says he'll go and we learn his name is Ted. He says he really doesn't want to, and the other villagers hype him up. He says he doesn't want to go anymore. 
Then Reef jump scares them saying he'll go. Ted asks him who he is, and Reef says he overheard their conversation. One of them asks if he knows the region, and he says yes. He's very familiar with it. The Valley of Death is a dungeon, and it's the remnants of the Silver Age. Fifty years ago there was a knight named Claude who went there, Todd mentioned him earlier, but he awakened Aura at 45 and went on many grand adventures. But his fame created arrogance, and he went to the Valley of Death with one servant and got bodied. And the problem was the demonic sword Elshin was lost there too. It's the symbol of the Elshin family that's been passed down for generations. And Stefan is part of the Elshins. Reef wonders if he's his grandson and watches him flirt with an elf in the party. Reef looks a bit jealous. He says there's only one saint in the party, and it's a boy named Ceylon. Reef wonders how the hell it's a dude, and says he should try talking to Todd. But he notices the atmosphere is a bit weird, and he wonders if Todd is into Ceylon. He says there's no way, and that Todd is a great guy. And Edward tells Reef he made a wise choice, Reef says it's no big deal. Edward explains how the villagers were scared, and Reef says it makes sense. Edward asks what's there to fear with so many knights around. Reef gets hella annoyed since all of these dudes are arrogant as hell. Then we hear a scream, and see things fly out of the trees above them, they spiral straight into the sky. And we see they unfold their wings and are actually harpies, they start to fly at the party. The knights say to prepare for a fight, one of them fly directly towards Stefan and Todd prepares a fire spell, and we see it bounce between the harpies. Ceylon casts a blessing on the knights, Reef says they are doing better than he thought. But that's from his perspective as a mage, as a martial artist they are weaklings. Then he sees that they aren't protecting the porters. A harpy flies directly at them and they close their eyes out of fear, but it gets punched in the face, which just makes it actually blow up, Reef says nobody is paying attention to him anyways. We learn that if he didn't take Ted's spot, he'd have died here. Stefan cuts down another harpy, and completely ignores those around him being attacked, and Reef points this out as he watches him tunnel vision, and that he doesn't help those around him. Ceylon tells Reef to hide quickly, and a harpy launches its wings at toward Reef, he doesn't even dodge since they won't hurt him at all. It pokes him in the eye, and he punches one of the harpies away. After the battle Stefan asks if the mages and priests are okay, Edward says they are. Reef then asks if he doesn't care about them. Stefan ignores him, and says that the Elshin knights are strong, and tells everyone to enjoy the feelings of victory. Reef then goes up to Todd, thanking him, then says he's heard that he's from the Delphia's Mage Tower, and asks if he knows Reifenhart saying he's his friend. Todd is surprised he has a friend like him, then starts to laugh like a freak saying that he's cute, Todd is a freak. Reef asks if he's doing well, and asks if anything weird happened in the last few years. He says nope, and starts to say how attractive he is. Actual freak behavior, Reef holds his anger back asking if his personality is any different. Todd says he's not interested in the kid's actions. Ceylon then walks up to Reef asking if he's okay, he says he's fine and gets her to heal the orcs. A soldier tells Ceylon to get away, asking why he's wasting energy on them. Reef compliments Ceylon for being kind and healing them regardless of their species. Stefan gets back to yapping, telling Reef to hurry and lead the way in a monotone voice, like my own. He tells them where to go, then a few hours later. We see the soldiers are really gassed out, wondering why there are so many monsters in this mountain. Reef then asks if they need to rest, and Stefan yells at them all saying to get up. Reef says knights are arrogant, clerics are serious and mages are narrow-minded and cheap. He's a mage to the bone. Stefan says now he understands what drove Claude to death, there are so many monsters on this tiny mountain. Then he sees the entrance to the dungeon, in a ravine. He asks Edward if it's what he thinks it is. He says yes, and that it's definitely the ancient runes Paulton. They get closer to the actual entrance, and get right to the main door and Todd tells them this is it. And it should be okay to enter, Stefan yells telling everyone to get ready. Reef says he'll wait here, and Stefan says his job is done he can just go. Reef says he has no way to get back though, and Stefan says since he did a good job they'll guide him back. Reef wonders if he should just kill him now. Stefan goes straight to chanting, saying they'll all go find the demonic sword now. Reef tells them good luck as they charge in, and after they are all gone he says it's time for him to start too. He explains how in the Silver Age this dungeon was a logistics base, but back in the Silver Age their technology was really advanced. He says in the past he came here with Cerise, and she used the slifes to figure out there's a secret path, and when she opened the doors up they started to uh do some risky stuff in a dangerous zone, he puts his hand on the wall and begins to open it. 
He says it's not as easy as he thought because he doesn't have as much mana, but the door eventually opens, and he takes his coat off saying he can't throw them away right now, and he says it's time to start testing his physical abilities. He hears a scream, and he wonders why he can hear the screams when they went in the other way. He then remembers it opens to the third floor in the basement, and it's a trespassing situation. He thinks for a second, then remembers how it's a military building so the security system must have triggered to repel the trespassers. And since he came with just him and Cerise they didn't need to worry about anyone else, but now he knows that isn't the case. And he starts to cringe and sweat, saying they are definitely screwed. Then we watch one of the knights loses his head, and Stefan shouts asking what the hell is going on, a weapon peers around the corner. And a ghoulish monster appears around it. Stefan says they can't beat this, asking how the hell a human is meant to defeat such a monster. We see Silan healing a soldier, and they thank him, he says he needs them to be alive to get out, and he almost died to the floor giving out, Silan, thanks Todd for using protection magic. Todd says that they survived the fall, but he's not sure about what's to come. They look at a stairwell, then we see soldiers get sent flying from a demon, it and some ghouls begin to walk down the stairs. Silan takes this chance to cast some magic to fight them off, he says dear Philanence grant them unwavering courage, he says them being afraid is a waste of their muscle. Then blesses them yet again, the soldiers start to get hyped up. Todd wonders how much divine power went into them for them to end up like berserkers. They start to charge at the demons who are ready to fight back, but Chin prepares a spell as well, and looks really cool while taking the demons' weapons out of their hands. The elf girl takes the chance to get above them, and quickly attacks one. But she gets backhanded, causing her to get sent across the room. She struggles to speak, asking if she was of help. Stefan says good job, and we learn her name is Lelcia. He quickly charges in and does a follow-up attack to the demon who sent her flying, and makes a main character pose afterwards. Edward says as expected of him, he tells everyone to pull it together, and this is where Claude was defeated. They then quickly notice fire above them and then something slams into the ground, and we see a fiery demon emerges. It roars loudly at the soldiers, then starts throwing them around like ragdolls. Stefan shouts, saying do not falter, and says they've surely made their resolves already. Some of them try to run away from the beast's attacks, he turns away from the heat and says he won't be defeated like this. He begins to run and saying he won't allow it, he leaps off one of his men's heads, saying he's the one who upholds the family name of Alshin. And he's earned the title of resolute hero, he attacks the beast piercing through it with his sword, but it's futile as he gets backhanded just like Lelcia did. He bounces across the floor, and lays their eyes wide open. Silon prays to his god again, and prepares an attack. And then it smacks the beast on the head, it looks like it's damaged it, but it glares at Silon, Who starts to feel fear, as it begins to charge straight at him. Silon closes his eyes, then hears a loud sound as we see the beast gets knocked back. Silon opens his eyes to see Reef's back, Reef begins to prepare for a follow-up. But then quickly stops and is surprised that the beast is no longer ablaze, or moving. He says no wonder he almost got one hit by Teslon, then he looks around to see the soldiers who were defeated, I think Stefan is brain dead now. More demons begin to come down the steps, and Todd and Silon both wonder who the hell Reef is, and we see him holding Lelcia. It jumps to later with Stefan waking up, Edward asks if he's come too, and he looks around to see the defeated enemies. He asks what happened, and Edward tells him. He's surprised that Reef was a martial artist, then says he failed to recognize him, and asks for his name. Then tells him his name is just Rifen. Edward thinks about how he's never heard of him before, Stefan asks what family he's from. Reef says he doesn't have one, Stefan starts to flame him in his head since he's not of a higher class, Stefan then quickly changes his attitude, saying he just cleaned up what they did, so it's a decent job. Reef says he clearly suffered a brain injury, and it was him who was useless. Stefan says how dare you not show respect, Edward tells him to calm down saying a normal person doesn't know about etiquettes. Stefan says that makes sense, then asks who taught him. He doesn't want to say Gerard's name, and says that he's self-taught. Reef then tells him to stop yapping and handle the injured. Edward says he speaks so carefree and naturally, but it doesn't seem like he knows he sounds prideful. Like he's talking down to his underlings, so he might be a royal of another country. It's like he's older talking down to someone who is much younger too, so he's really strange. Silan then approaches Reef, asking how tall he is. He tells him, and then Silan looks excited and asks about his weight. Then gets closer, asking about his training, Reef wonders why he's so friendly. Then we get some backstory on how Silan lost his parents early, 
and was raised in an orphanage, and was picked on for being pretty and weak. And he began to long for a muscular body and deep voice, and he dreamed of being a monk. But that was far from his expectations as he never got taller, and his hair began to grow faster. He even began to weight train, but it only increased his divine power. And he began to look up to muscular people, and he looks at Reef saying how beautiful he is. Reef quickly says he'll go scout, and Ceylon goes to follow. But he tells him to wait, since they'll need him around if there's an injury. Stefan says he'll go, and Lelcia can stay here, and asks if it's fine. Reef says he doesn't care, they start to go down the hallway, and Stefan keeps in her monologuing about how he can't believe a country bumpkin isn't feeling proud to have a night with him, and he'll put him in his place soon. And he hopes a demon gets to come out soon, then gets karate chopped. Reef says time for the delusional kid to take a nap, then ghouls begin to run at them. As they get close, Reef quickly combos them killing them quickly. He starts to hum saying time to find the treasure, he heads to a room that's destroyed. He finds some gold from the silver age, but keeps looking for something else. Then finds the limitless bag, which can hold a lot of items. He starts to smile saying there's a lot of other good items in here too. Stefan wakes up and looks around, and Reef says the ghouls hit him in the back of the head, and that he got one hit. Stefan wonders why things are going bad, and thanks him. Reef says it's nothing and smiles. Then knocks him out again three more times, and he wonders if he'll accidentally kill him at this rate. Stefan says it's strange since he isn't detecting anything. Reef says they've covered most paths so it's time to go. As they regroup and start heading out, Ceylon asks Reef is he's a royal, he says no he's just normal. Ceylon says he's so capable, and Reef asks what's wrong with that. Ceylon also explains how the way he talks down to people is so natural. He gives an example of how Edward is 40 yet he talks down to him too. Reef then realizes he messed up, and blames it on not being used to talking to people. They finally make it to a unique looking door. And when they open it everyone is surprised as they see a monster named Grell Beast roaring at them. Reef says he doesn't remember it being here before. Then he says it must be because it wasn't taken care of yet, he tells them all they should return as it would be hard to beat this right now. One of the men point out the sword it's holding, and it's the demonic sword Elshin. Edward then asks Stefan if he's really planning to fight it. He says that should be obvious, Edward tries to plea with him saying it's too dangerous, but Stefan says he cannot let the sword be dirtied anymore. Even if it was the Grim Reaper himself, he wouldn't back down, he tells everyone to ready their swords. Reef thinks about how dumb of a plan that is. We get more lore, about how within the cracks of the dungeons there's a system designed to compensate for the system's weakness, but due to a malfunction the supernatural monsters have been absorbed by the defense system. And the guardians of the dungeon, were living freely until they were forced into this. But due to it being fused with the dungeon it's stronger now. And since it killed an aura user like Clote it has powers from a different dimension. Stefan yells saying it's chained up, asking if his men are afraid of it. Reef tries to warn them they'll all die if they fight it, Edward asks what a barbarian would know, and there are things risking your life for. They all start to charge at it, and Reef just thinks they are dumb. Ceylon begins to buff them all with a spell, some of the soldiers attack the Grell Beast, but it quickly sends them away. Reef sighs, saying he tried to warn them, and then jokes there goes another one as they fly by his head. He says they are getting the shit beat out of them. He understands that Stefan won't listen no matter what he says, but at least Edward seems reasonable. He does give Stefan credit for holding out until now, Hess dodging all of its attacks, but he really isn't doing any damage either. Ceylon prepares another spell for support. Then rocks a killer Jojo pose so his stand can go crazy, then the Grell Beast gets hit by the attack, which are divine maces. Lelcia jumps off the Grell Beast's head, and her and Stefan preform a combo attack. Reef says that Lelcia is much more skilled than Stefan, and he wonders if he underestimate them too much. As Chin prepares a spell too I guess, it's some kind of tornado. That makes the system activate. And it forces the boss fight to skip into phase 2. Reef realizes this isn't good, as the Grell Beast is now free from his chains, and leaps onto the soldiers, and starts absolutely mogging them. Stefan yells and goes for an attack, but of course he gets uppercutted like the side character he is. Edward yells out for him, and he quickly runs over to Stefan who seems to be alright. Lelcia heads straight in, and jumps into the air like Stefan but she actually manages to fight back against the Grell Beast. He does hit her in the side though, and sends her away. Then begins to prepare for a fire breath attack, and launches at all the soldiers, some of them get hit while others are lucky enough to avoid it. We see Ceylon is in the attack's direct path, 
He's afraid as it gets close, but as it gets closer Reef jumps in front of it to block it. He deflects the attack around the both of them. He apologizes to Ceylon for being slow to react, then gets ready to brawl the Grell Beast. He wonders if he can even handle it, he says he was curious as to what his full power is like. And when he was a mage he'd never had made this gamble, but now he's a warrior. So he's more than ready to try and figure out. He releases two rapid attacks onto the Grell Beast, it attacks back at him, but he dodges it, but gets grazed and it actually draws blood. Then the Grell Beast comes out of left field with a spinning back kick, like he's a UFC fighter. Kicking Reef straight in the side, it sends him flying straight into the wall, and Ceylon screams out to him. He quickly walks back saying he's fine, Ceylon is surprised and asks if this is the power of an aura user. Reef says if he just ate it he could have hit it back, but after getting hit by all of those attacks from Gerard he wanted to parry it. The beast speaks enchantment table, and Reef says he doesn't know what it means, but he's ready to brawl. They start trading a flurry of blows with one another, Stefan sees him using aura, and wonders how a lowborn can do it when he and Noble cannot even start the basics of manifestation. He says that this cannot be right, and wonders who the hell Reef is, asking where a monster like him came from. Reef dodges another blow from the Grell Beast, he says he can finally appreciate everything he's learned, since its movements seem dull. He counter-attacks by blowing its arm off, we learn that the Guardians don't fall even if they receive major injuries, since the ruins heal their injuries. Grell Beast starts to channel another breath attack, but Reef evades it then grabs into its arm to go for an RKO, then kicks it in the head. Then follows it up with rapid strikes, saying the Grell Beast is the perfect sandbag. The soldiers watch in awe as he effortlessly toys with it, he sees them waiting and decides he should use Calamity Horn. But he understands that if he does then the whole place will crumble, and all the baggage is annoying. Cod tells him to wield a sword then he can defeat it by using a divine spell on it. Reef says he doesn't know how to cover his weapons with aura. And he only knows how to use it on his body, that's just how his clan is. Ceylon calls out to him, and asks if his body is durable. He says that it's quite strong, then goes to summon his stand, never mind puts a blessing on Reef. Causing him to swell up with divine power, he clenches his teeth then grabs the Grell Beast by its arms, throwing it into a wall behind him. Reef is shocked that he cast a spell you use on metal objects on his body. And for someone so pretty his personality is whack. He decides to just end it quickly and run straight at the Grell Beast, kicking it into the air, following it with his knee. He then starts to swing at it, uppercutting the hell out of the Grell Beast. This causes it to fly straight into the air and as it falls down it gets split in half by Reef hitting it from below. Ceylon sees him posing and starts to fanboy hard as hell. Then asks if it's over now, Reef says to undo the spell quickly. Stefan wobbles over to him, saying he hit his identity well, asking if they were laughable to him. He acknowledges he's strong, but he can't forgive the fact he stopped on his knightly honor, and for sneering at them. Reef says he's never sneered, and that's from having interest, but he has none. He starts to walk away and Stefan draws his sword and swings at Reef, but he bends down to pick up the demonic sword Alshin. Then notices Stefan's goofy ass as he falls down a hill. He gets embarrassed asking why he dodged, Reef says he went to pick the sword up since he was making a fuss over it. Edward tells him that Reef's lack of greed in the presence of greatness is what true strength looks like. Reef thinks about how it's just some second-rate weapon, so there's no need to greed. But says it's time to head back now, and at Cattle Village the villagers watch as Ceylon heals a baby, and then Reef spots him handing them gold as well. Saying Ceylon is quite smart, as Stefan's group rides out he tells Edward he wants to investigate Reef. And he delusionally thinks he's not weaker than him. Reef decides it's time to meet Cerise, then asks Ceylon why he's following him. Ceylon then brings up how there are priests who travel to show the goddess grace. And how he wanted to return to the order, but decided to use this chance for a pilgrimage, and if possible to travel with Reef. Reef sweats saying his eyes look like Todd's, and wonders if he's into him. He wonders how to reject Ceylon, but says that he's just a first aid kit. And Cerise might get hurt, so it'll be good to have him help her. Ceylon quickly asks how to get abs, Reef tells him about his training. Then it jumps to later in the night and we hear a dude Malding asking why she wasn't trained properly. And how an elf should be loyal and offer their mind and body to their owner his name is Beret. And he wonders why her eyes look so arrogant. She says she was born like this, then he tells his butler to go find a better product, since this one is defective. And that he needs to return her, the elven girl is known as 148 and this'll be her third time being returned. She's probably Cerise. Reef then arrives in Zeppelin which is part of the Chatton area. 
We see a busy street view, and Ceylon comments that it's just what you'd expect from a capital city. He begs Reef to slow down, asking if he's flexing the fact he has long legs. And they happen to spot a fat noble about to abuse a poor man. Porky's name is Tariq. Porky starts to hit the man, saying he'll teach him a lesson. And says for 30 hits this is enough, and throws 30 gold coins at him. Ceylon quickly runs over to the man asking if he's okay, and heals him. He suggests they go find the police, but the old man says this much money is enough. Ceylon asks the man if he's just going to act like nothing happened, Reef tells him the people here are money driven. Ceylon says this place is hella weird, and wonders how the town operates as a commerce city like this, and asks why he's here. Reef says to buy something, Ceylon asks what, he tells him he's here to buy an elf and sweats nervously. Ceylon quickly covers his body, saying he's one of those types of people. Reef tries to explain, saying it's not what he thinks. Ceylon says uck men. Reef says but he's one too, and Ceylon sighs saying that's true. It jumps to some noble place, and inside we see Porky talking to his elves, then spots someone. It's Beret, and he calls out to him, and asks about the elf he bought recently. Beret says he returned her. Porky laughs saying it's funny he can't domesticate an elf. Beret tells him to give it a try, and others have returned her too. Porky thinks about how he's going to try now. Then it jumps again to Reef asking Ceylon what the hell he's doing, he says he's working out and struggles to do a push-up. Reef says not to push too hard since he can't have him with doms. Ceylon says he'll always be able to move, then Reef watches Ceylon heal himself, Ceylon says it's just as simple as that. Reef says now he knows why the kid isn't gaining muscle, healing magic is similar to turning back time, and since muscles need to be damaged and repaired to grow. It makes sense now. He's just going back to the state before he began training, Ceylon asks if there's something wrong, Reef says no and he'll teach him a better method later and asks if it's annoying for his hair to be so long. Ceylon says it just grows quickly, and Reef asks what he's thinking about. There's apparently a Korean saying that if you think of lewd things your hair grows fast. He says it's time to go to the slave auction, and they head out. Reef explains how there are a lot of different species at the auction, but elves are the most popular due to their beauty dot which makes them very expensive. Compared to the other slaves, they can cost up to 160 times as much. They also have long lifespans, which means their growth stages are longer too, so there's a famous joke that a foolish merchant will die before his baby elf grows up. They are going to the Elfenheim which is an elf-only auction, Reef hates the name, and Ceylon goes cross-eyed. He says they are treated better than orcs, Reef says they are still slaves though. So they aren't happy. Ceylon says they used to live in the wild, so why would they not be happy here? Reef says this is what the average human thinks, and he needs to establish a different empire than the one he had previously. Then a man comes into the room saying sorry for making you wait, and introduces him to the prided beauties of Elfenheim. Ceylon quickly covers his eyes while screaming, and the man wonders why a young lady is here. Reef then asks if there are any with darker skin, the man says what a unique taste, Ceylon looks disgusted, Reef tried to explain that isn't what he meant. The man says there is one with darker skin, and he'll guide them to her. They begin to walk through the halls, the man explains that they let all the elves exercise, and feeds them a diet suited for the queens of the forest, since it makes them smell better. Reef angrily says he doesn't care for any of this, just take him to the slave. The guy awkwardly coughs and looks away, we get to a door and he says he's here for 148, they enter and we see the younger elves are sparring one another. And if he looks across he can see the female he requested. Reef begins to cry, since he's finally found Cerise. We get a flashback inside of a lab, and Cerise is telling Reef he can't mix those, then it explodes. He apologizes, saying he thought he was cooking. She said he burned that shit, and wonders why he's so cute even though he's old, and she wipes his face off. He asks when she'll stop calling him Sir Reifenhart, and to just call him Reef, she says she can't, so he asks her why. Then we see the Antares Empire on fire, with Reef looking over at it all. The four heavenly kings are kneeling behind him and Tathid says he's here for his final regards. Reef asks why they are looking like it's their first time seeing someone on the verge of death. He says the two million forces the humans brought was probably everything they could muster up. He wonders what the aftermath will be like, Tathid asks why he doesn't escape with them, and he says they'll only be able to escape if he holds them back. And he tells Poth to accept his apologizes, saying even with the gods guarantee he failed. Poth says it was an oracle, and we learn they have a prophecy about how Reef would appear, and to follow him for salvation.
Reef was surprised about it, saying he couldn't wrap his head around it. Then he tells all of the heavenly kings that he hopes to meet them again one day, and that they survive this. He also tells Cerise to leave, but she says she'll be waiting for him. He tells her that there's no telling what'll happen, and she should find someone nice. She says again she'll be waiting, and he tries to tell her otherwise, but she barks at him. He sees that she isn't just saying baseless words, and hugs her tightly. The flashback ends and the slave handler says he hates showing 148 to customers, as she's defective. And how her personality is absolutely horrible, he double checks Reef wants to buy her. And says he can probably add a few hundred gold coins since his taste is so weird. He tells Reef 300 gold, and Ceylon says that's really cheap. Cerise then appears, asking if he's her new owner. He begins to take his jacket off seeing her scars. The man says they can call a priest, and he says it's fine, and tells Ceylon he can do it. He puts the jacket on her, saying she should wear this for now. Then says he knows she doesn't have a name, and suggests she take the name Cerise. She says she's memorized it, and that her name will be Cerise Valencia now. She asks if it's his surname, he says no then introduces himself in Ceylon. She says understood, it jumps to later with the slave handler telling someone 148 is gone, and of course it's Porky. Who is in disbelief, he wonders if it was Beret who bought it. The man says no, it was someone he's never seen before. Porky asks his name, but the man says he didn't really care to ask, since he paid instantly. Porky is surprised since he was able to pay for an elf, and the man says she was defective so she was cheap. Then he starts to describe what Reef looks like to Porky, saying he'll recognize him. Then it jumps to Cerise trying on new clothes, and being fully healed as well. He says this is good enough, and even Ceylon is blushing. He asks if she's hungry, and Cerise says if Master is, he tells her not to think of him like that, she asks if she'll be returning her. He says that's not what he means, and Cerise wonders why he's treating her like a human girl. He tells her to treat him like a comrade, so call him by his name rather than master. She says she guesses he's a pervert into adventurer roleplay. And he'll probably want to act like the hero traveling with a swordswoman. She starts to munch saying humans are all the same, Reef gives up some lore on the restaurant saying it's famous, and treat it as a place of worship. Ceylon says if this is meant to be worship, why is the food not free? Reef says it's a business, and says that Philanin's religion uses beauty as their business. Ceylon says yeah since it doesn't go against religion, while they talk he notices Ceylon just going to town. She sees him staring, then tries to look dignified. He wonders if she doesn't like it, but says he wanted to treat her well. He says he met her as a savior before, but now he's a buyer. So it's day and night compared to before, he wonders if he met her too soon. He decides it's fine for now, and she'll accept him eventually. They go to a weapons vendor, and he tells Cerise to pick a weapon out, she picks a rapier, and he says he thought she used a scimitar. She's surprised he knew that, and Ceylon covers for our boy saying he can tell by looking at their hands. Ceylon also gets a weapon, and Reef asks what a priest needs that for. As they are walking, he spots some dudes in an alley staring at them, and one of them says they want to talk to him. Reef gives them a stare, then asks what is it. The man says a noble wants the elf with him, Reef says so what, glaring at the man. The man says they'll buy her for a reasonable price, and tells him to look at the bill of exchange. Reef says no, and the man asks if he's refusing, Reef asks if he's dumb or something. The man says he doesn't seem to understand, they are offering a lot of money. Reef says it's the other way around, the man doesn't understand he isn't interested. The man tells him he's leaving him with no choice, and then they walk off. Reef wonder what their deal was, Ceylon says he's a goofy dude. Then it cuts to night, at Porky's house and he's asking why the man who is named Romad came empty-handed. Romad tells him that he was unwilling, Porky says to beat him up and toss some coins at him. Romad says they'll find a chance to kidnap her, and lie to him that she died and give him money. Porky says bet, and to take Landis with him. Back to where Reef is staying in, we see him looking at the money he has left. He says he had 2000 gold ready, but now he has a lot more left over, but it's not much compared to rebuilding his empire. He wonders if he should invest the gold, rather than carrying it around with him. He says he remembers the Crovin's kingdom being struck by a famine here. Due to the land being fertile, and blessed by the goddess of earth, so they've not thought of preparing for a famine. But it ends up happening anyways, so maybe he should invest in grains. The trade unions that come to his mind are Rolefin, Karen, and Tobin. But he won't invest in Rolefin, since he's a pervert and abused Cerise. 
And if he had to pick one, he'd invest in the Tobin. It jumps to the leader of the Tobin, Shevold, saying that the Roleffen are selling their wheat and barley for half price, and that's just horrible business, so he might lose his partners at this rate. So he needs to do something. Someone comes in saying he has a guest, and Shevold jokingly says to send him back if he doesn't have a lot. Then he tells Shevold the man offered 1,500 gold. We see of course that it's Reef, saying he wants to invest into grains. Specifically in the Krovens' kingdom. Shevold says that it's like selling soap to orcs, it won't sell. Reef makes a joke about the orcs, he says it'd be his problem if it doesn't work out and he'd benefit from the result if it turns out well, right? Shevold says even so he can't recommend a customer to make a bad investment, Reef gets up saying he'll go to a different union, Shevold tells him to wait and that truthfully they aren't in a good situation. But with this money it'll be really beneficial to him right now, and he'd like to recommend a different investment. Reef says he was adamant in his past life too, but says it's his money and he wants to use it in the way he wants. And the only promise he needs to make is that he won't spend it for his personal use. Shevold says of course, Reef says he believes there's another branch in the Graham Kingdom right? Shevold says yes, then he asks if he has a branch near the Delphia's Mage Tower. He says no, but you gotta pass by it anyways. Reef then asks if he can investigate someone there for him. Reef thinks it's a good chance to find information out about his other body. Then it cuts to Cerise holding a dagger, she then begins to swing it around, Ceylon is impressed by it, and Cerise leaps in the air and recalls, presumably her mother telling her that High Elves were once the guardians of the forest. And everything in the forest was their friends, though they are being pushed back by humans, Eldia will lead them back to paradise once again, they are the descendants of the great fairy, so do not lose her pride. Then it shows Cerise watching as their kingdom is burned down, and an elf tells her that she's going to be sold since she's pretty. So learn loyalty and politeness to become a good elf, then it shows her being beat. And fed mere scraps, other elves mocked her for being a pure blood for some reason, so her only salvation was the sword. She grew to like the sword as it helped her reconnect to the pride her mother talked about so often. She finishes swinging, and cries while thinking about the memories of her past, and she starts speaking an elven language to remind herself. Ceylon claps saying that was super cool, asking how she moved around like that. Cerise says she just tried her best, Ceylon sighs asking why her and Reef give the same answer. Then he tries to imitate it, and then we hear Romad saying there she is. And tells Cerise to follow him, and it's time to greet her true master. Cerise stares at him, and we see there's quite a few dudes who came. Ceylon points at them, asking who they are. Romad tells him to not be expecting anyone, as they've taken measures. Ceylon says he's not that guy pal. One of the goons leaps at him saying he's annoying, but Cerise blocks the attack, then slices his throat. The other men begin to charge at her, but she swiftly avoids their hits, and counter-attacks. Slicing their throats too. Romad asks how dare a slave do this, but realizes that she's strong, Ceylon then begins to cast a spell, but Cerise moves him out of the way, as a dagger is thrown at him. Romad says nobody will mention it if a pilgrim were to die. Ceylon gets scared, but Cerise tells him it's okay, and starts to walk forward while twirling her dagger. She points it at them, saying it's no problem. Romad looks pissed, and then tells someone named Takata that it's time to work. We see an orc warrior beginning to walk up, and he says we'll catch Elf, and some other stuff, he's just trying to tell her it's her fate and he's sorry. Romad tells him not to injure her, and he says he'll grab her. He goes in, and she goes to block his attack but he hits her with a sword's version of a Brazilian kick, and it hits her on the shoulder. He's not using the sharp end of the sword, but she recognizes he's strong. Saying she wishes she had her scimitar. She counter-attacks, but he blocks it since she aims for his throat. Romat asks why he's struggling against an elf. Takata says he guesses he'll starve tonight too. They continue trading blows with one another, and he slowly makes ground on her, then raises his sword for an attack she runs directly at him blocking it with her dagger. Takata doesn't want to injure her, and once he sees she isn't dodging. He moves his sword away, she smirks as she expected this. Then cuts through some of his armor, wounding him. He says he almost killed her, and asks if she is crazy. But she just believed in his ability. Ceylon then asks if Cerise can block flying daggers, she says yes. Ceylon says okay, then goes to chant again. Romad grabs a dagger, and throws it saying he told him to stay out of it. Cerise quickly gets in front of it, deflecting it. Ceylon asks for his goddess Philonens to beat that dude's ass, and summons quite a few maces. Everyone is surprised by this, 
as a giant mace begins to swing down onto Romad and his boys. We see a giant dust cloud form, Ceylon tells Cerise his spells only work on demons and the undead, but it'll buy them time. So they need to haul absolutely cheeks. She grabs onto him, then throws her dagger at the wall. Jumps onto it, then leaps further into the air, breaking through a window. She shields him from the glass, and Romad tells Takata to get up there. We hear an older man asking why he's making such a fuss over one elf, and says to think they couldn't get her even with a veteran orc warrior, he says he'll do his part asking where she is. He's probably Lantis. He vanishes after Romad said where she went, and we see he's leapt into the tree and instantly through the window, even Romad is surprised he moves so fast, saying he expected as much from an aura user. Lantis says he missed this, hide and seek that is. We see Ceylon and Cerise running down the hallway, and Ceylon says they can handle a few people at least. Cerise still thinks he's a girl, we see one of Romad's boys, but he's greeted by a jumping Cerise, who kicks him in the face. Ceylon says they need to quickly grab their shit and go, then casts another spell. We see Lantis walking down the hall, and since he's an aura user he can use his aura to feel the environment. So he knows what they are planning, he kicks the door down saying he's surprised the cleric could use such a spell. Since he made it into the bedroom, Romad quickly out of breath catches up asking if they've run up, and if he knows where they are. Lantis tells him to shut up, and they couldn't have gone far, turns out they did juke him. We see them running down some stairs, and Cerise asks why they aren't on the streets. Ceylon says they need to avoid people as much as possible, as people would turn against them. Now he understands why pilgrims die so quickly. But he doesn't want to return and be captured by her, which due to Manhua logic. He won't explain who. He says if only Reef was here, and wonders where he is. Cerise asks if he's that strong, and Ceylon says they need to find him now. He begins to cast a spell while they run, and it begins to show him paths to take. He explains how love turns coincidence into destiny, and to think of this spell as like the strings of fate, and how with filaments on his side, finding Reef should be his destiny. But it's meant for lovers, and it isn't meant to be used this way. He then tells Cerise that she's strong, and he's only ever seen another elf slayer named Lelcia, Cerise says she didn't expect him to be a high-ranking cleric either. He then feels like he's talking to a human, rather than a slave. She asks if this is the right place, and Ceylon says yes, this is where fate led them. They hear the sound of footsteps, then look over to see Lantis. Cerise says quickly that isn't Reef, and Lantis says he found them, and it was quite a workout. He says that they shouldn't run again, Cerise realizes if they try to flee they'll be exposed so the only choice is to fight. She leaps at him, and swings her dagger. Lantis quickly appears behind her, saying that she's definitely talented. She swings behind her, but he moves again saying her effort feels unusual for a slave. She wonders what the hell he is. Ceylon also recognizes that he's powerful as hell, wondering why he's here. He then blesses Cerise's blade, with divine power. Lanta says to use that many spells at once, Ceylon is at the level of a bishop at least. Ceylon then encourages Cerise to beat his ass, but Lantis keeps dodging all her attacks, saying this didn't change anything. Ceylon says good job, then we see that Cerise's blade breaks in half, and she's surprised. Lantis we see her get sent flying into the air and blood is drawn, he says he was just playing with her. Ceylon says uh oh, and realizes that Lantis is an aura user. And he sheathed his sword again. Ceylon wonders why an aura user is here, since an aura user can live in luxury anywhere. Romad finally catches up and says his name. Ceylon recognizes the name Lantis, and mentions how he's a renowned knight of the Tekken Kingdom. And the Entity Kingdom rejoiced after he managed to use aura in his thirties. But he had a secret he couldn't share to others, he had a bad fetish that began with elf slaves, but eventually led to him doing it on humans. He became a disgrace to the kingdom. Ceylon calls him a monster, and compares him to the boogeyman. He says for an aura user to get involved in such evil things, he's as filthy as the rumors suggest. Lanta smiles, saying he killed hundreds in the Tekken Kingdom, and fled here, but he was happy to have played with them. Romad smirks, since Lantis's infamy is nothing compared to the value of having an aura user on their side. And they can make him do dirty work since he enjoys it so much. Lanta stretches his fingers out, saying he'll seal Sillin's power for a moment. Since he's aware that he's a high level, it would be bad to let him speak. Romad tells him not to harm the elf anymore, or else Porky will get upset. Lantis says he can just heal her, so it's no problem. And that the cleric is good looking, they think he's a woman. Ceylon shudders, then quickly says he's a dude. 
Lantis says that just makes it even better, and that he's going to take great care of him, he cuts Romad's hand, and Lantis is impressed. Asking how he's standing without being able to heal, and that he's a beautiful frail zombie. But it looks like they'll need to amputate his limbs sadly, then we see a giant explosion behind the group. Ceylon looks full of hope, and we hear Reef saying he found them. And they dared to go after Cerise. He begins to menacingly walk at them, while taking his jacket off. Lantis is surprised by how muscular he is, and asks what the hell he's sensing from him. Romad says he's the one who bought the elf, and Lantis says he thought he said he was a normal dude. And he starts to shiver saying that he can tell he's far from ordinary, and that he must be an aura user too since he can't judge his skill, but wonders how the hell he is so young. But says he must be in his late 30s, Lantis says it's been a while since he's met someone strong. Reef chuckles saying stop pretending to be a knight when you're just an old pervert, and to start already. Lantis goes to unsheathe his blade, and Reef gets ready too. He charges straight at Lantis, who reciprocates. They trade strikes with one another, creating a shockwave from their clash. Reef towers over Lantis, and goes for an overhand right. Lantis smiles, then they begin to trade blow for blow with one another, Lantis seems to be enjoying it for now. One of Romad's guys say they need to get out of here, Romad says they'll die if they get caught in it while trying to run. They make their way to the high ground fighting one another, and Cerise is surprised Reef can use Aura. Ceylon says he thought he told her, Lantis quickly realizes that this isn't the skill of someone who recently awakened Aura. He swings his word, creating like a claw attack with his Aura, Reef dodges under it, but it begins to wrap behind him too. He hits it with a key bullet, Lantis says he's way too proficient with Aura. He either awakened in his teens, or is 40 with a baby face. But either one makes no sense at all. Reef continues to block all of his attacks and wonders why he's so damn strong, and that he plans to beat anyone down who says martial arts is good for character development. Lantis quickly creates distance and is surprised that Reef is bare-handed and asks if he's Gerard's disciple. Reef stares at him, but doesn't answer. Lantis asks why he's so caught up over a slave when he's this strong. Reef asks who he's calling a slave, saying that slaves are still people with emotions. Lantis is surprised, and Reef goes on by asking if he's ever tried to talk to them, and question why they are slaves. He punches at Lantis, breaking the pillar he was standing on. Lantis says he doesn't know what bullshit he's spewing, Reef says everyone in his past life thought the same too, and it's just too deep routed in humanity. They see the other species and think they are emotionless, even though they can laugh and cry. He asks what humans are better at than elves. Lantis says it's just natural they take the other species and make them slaves. And what would they be if they weren't slaves? Reef asks why the descendants of the great fairies need to be slaves. Saying he's never considered that if humans didn't dominate the world they'd be the slaves instead. He attacks Atlantis again, but is getting cuts all over. He explains how when humanity took the other species as slaves they were filled with joy. He flies in for the people's elbow, saying if you permit slaves, then he's permitting himself to become one too. Lantis asks if he's out of his mind, asking if he really thinks their species are equal. Reef destroys the ground where Lantis was standing, and says that Cerise is not a slave, he punches at him again but gets dodged. With slavery rooted into the continent humans who are weak and powerless are forced into a life of slavery. That is what serfdom is, and the implementation of a bad ideology always comes to bite them in the ass. But the foolish humans aren't aware yet, they keep clashing, and eventually Reef lands a kick on Lantis's side, sending him flying straight into the wall. He looks over, to see Reef is right in his face already, and he's pissed. He's determined to make a change no matter what it takes, since he hates the other species being treated as slaves. He punches Lantis in the stomach, causing him to cough up blood while shoving him further into the wall. The force is enough to actually shatter the wall entirely, and sends him through it, making him crash into a higher portion of the ruins they are in. Reef says the exact same thing he just did, saying he'll make it so nobody can call her a slave, or so that people don't think of slavery in the first place. He will change the world for her, she calls him insane, she says that he's absolutely crazy, saying an elf isn't a slave. And she wonders how deep his role-playing is going, and wonders if he's a helpless pervert but she recalls him mentioning the great fairies, and how her mother told her about it before. Lantis begs for mercy, and Reef asks why he should spare him. Lantis says he swears on his sword that he'll reflect on his sins, and change his life around. Reef says his expression looks believable, but he hates the Sayer Holy Order. And says if he wants to repent he should turn himself in. Lantis says he'll do just that then, 
and he doesn't need to get dirty blood on his hands. Reef says that's too late, and he's already good dirty blood on his hands. But says fine, if he truly repents then surely he knows he deserves death, and he'll make it quick and painless. Then they hear the sound of him hitting the floor, and he cracked Landis's head open like a watermelon. He says the word repent isn't for a bastard to use haphazardly. He gets off the wall, and asks Ceylon and Cerise if they are okay, Cerise asks him if he's okay, but doesn't call him sir. This makes him blush and she thinks that he's weird. Ceylon points out Romad and them are trying to flee, and he tells them to come here. He says they can try to run, but they'll experience something fun. Then he asks on whose order are they here. He says if they tell him he'll grant them mercy, they nervously sweat, and then it jumps to later in the night and they have been beaten up. They eventually tell him it was Porky of the Roloff and Union. He recognizes the name, saying he's the one who abused Cerise for 10 years in his past life. He wanted to kill him first, but when he found him he was already dead. Romad says he can't think of going after him. He owns the second biggest trade union in the principality so he'll become an enemy of the region. Reef says that he's aware, and knows exactly what kind of bastard he is. He says he'll grant them mercy like he said, and tells them to get close together so they don't freeze to death. Two of them blush and Romad calls them freaks. It cuts to Porky's house, and Beret is there too, they are wearing nothing but robes, and WWE see the elves he bought for Landis to abuse and kill. Beret says it's loud as hell outside, and Porky says it's one of those days. We see his guards fighting, but they turn into potato dudes as they get bodied one after another. Ceylon then erases their memories. Reef asks why he's doing that, and he says because physical attacks can also be memories. Then says what would he do without his abilities, Reef says he'd have entered solo and left with Porky's head. Ceylon says he also wants to see him get beat to death. W move. Takata then appears, and Reef brings up his honor as a warrior, asking what he's doing. Takata says it's just his duty, and if we're to get swept away and bend his will he'd not be a warrior. Reef asks if living as a slave isn't against his honor. And says the man isn't his mentor, Takata says he won't give his duty up, even if it's forces. Reef smiles saying that's orc-like, Ceylon asks how he can speak orc, and Sias is surprised too, saying she'll handle Takata. He asks if she'll be okay, and she says yeah her weapon is different this time. Takata says she's gotten stronger, Reef tells Ceylon to watch her back, and Takata asks if he's going to Tariq. Reef says his opponent isn't him, but the elf in front of him, and Takata says true. He then finds Porky's door, and opens it saying he can smell drugs, then he sees an elf's body and blood, Porky and Beret ask who he is and then call for their guards. Reef says he's seen many dirty things, but he refuses to let this one go. Porky calls for his guards again, then Reef looks down to see two elf girls with blood around their mouths. Reef gets even angrier asking why there are people in this world alive, when they shouldn't be. Porky calls for Takata, and wonders where his men are. He asks Reef if he wants money, but he doesn't answer. Porky says it must be the work of the Tobin Trade Union, and he'll pay him double the amount they are. Reef says for Cerise to be under this pig for 10 years, he can't bear it. Then punches him in the stomach, saying he missed the chance before. Porky starts to vomit, asking what he did wrong, Reef picks him up by his hair, saying a thing like him dares to touch Cerise, Porky says he doesn't know who that is. He starts to violently beat him as Beret watches. And beats him until he dies, saying this might seem unfair, but it's just karma. Beret calls him a murderer and Reef asks if he isn't. Beret says he's lived his life without guilt. Reef says that sounds about right, then Cerise and Ceylon peer around the door to see a pig dead on the floor. Cerise comments saying it's cruel, he tells her they deserve worse, Ceylon says he agrees. Cerise says he must be quite used to this sight. Then Ceylon tells him how Cerise beat Takata. He senses that Takata is alive, and says that's good. Beret then says she's the elf he returned. Cerise asks if he's the one who killed the child beside her. He asks what'll she do if he was. She draws her blade, saying this is the least she can do. Then she stabs him, he tries to crawl and begs for help. But she stabs him again, saying she won't let him touch that child's body. Reef looks sad watching her, then we see a forest and a campfire, as there are elves and orcs huddled around it. Takata is talking to Cerise telling her these were all the slaves there, and that her master is now his. Ceylon comments on how there aren't a lot of male elves. Cerise says it's because they aren't popular. We see them comforting each other, and she wonders if her thoughts on Reef were wrong. On cue he appears saying he's sorry for making them wait. He has a contract with him, 
saying it's their slave contracts. Ceylon asks where he found it, he says he broke the office wall down to expose a safe. Ceylon says that's barbaric, and Reef says he's never heard that in his 50 years, then catches himself and says he's turning into a simpleton. Ceylon asks why he brought the contract, he says since they'll need it. Reef says he wants to grant them all freedom, asking if they want that. They start to ask among each other what freedom is. He sighs since they don't understand, and Ceylon asks if he's going to run a new slave trade, he says hell no. He then asks if he's planning to give up on being an adventurer then. He uses the tree to stamp the contract, saying now they aren't porky slaves anymore, since freeing them will be nothing but his own satisfaction and it'll expose them to other dangers. He says he needs to educate them first. It jumped to the Tobin Union, and Shevolt says he recognizes the slaves as Tariqs, asking how he bought them all. He says he'll find out later, and he wants them to take care of them secretly. He'll be hearing some news tomorrow morning, and he'll be the one to figure it out then. And if people found out Porky's slaves are here they'd be suspicious of Shevolt. He's lost as hell, get this man a map. Reef says not to worry about it, and he'll give him a hundred gold coins to start, so take care of them for now. He says that Reef must have robbed the Roleffin Manor, but he tells him he has a place they can stay. He says to make sure that nobody is allowed to treat them like slaves unless it's himself. He says okay, but that 100 gold seems like too much. Reef says he wants him to use some of it and educate them. He says most of them should have gotten it from Tariq, and Reef says he doesn't mean slave education. He wants them to receive an actual proper education. Shivolt asks why he would go to such an extent for them, Reef says the better skilled they are, the more convenient it is for him. Shivolt says a slave cannot have a proper education. Reef says that it's his money, he will decide what to do with it, so try anyways. Shivolt says he'll try, but he doesn't know a scholar who would teach a slave. Reef says he knows that scholars are arrogant, but he's sure there are students among the scholars who are peasants and are poor. Shivolt asks how a student is meant to be a teacher, Reef says they don't need anything great. Just a basic knowledge is good. Shivolt says okay, but he doesn't think the slaves will be able to learn, and compares it to teaching a dog to read. Reef says there were people who proposed the idea of educating a slave before, but most people rejected it for the same reasons as Shivolt, and he'll use their simple beliefs to his advantage. He says the reason they don't educate slaves is for protection against a revolt. But most humans aren't aware of that, and Shivolt will see once the slaves learn that they are just ordinary people, and he'll teach his slaves too. And it might indeed create a wave big enough to cross the continent. And this might be the best course of action to change people's minds in this life. Back at where they are lodging, he's asking Ceylon if he has money. Saying he accidentally gave Shivolt at all because he's dumb. Cerise asks if she should return her outfit, he quickly says no need to do that. And she laughs, which was the first time she's ever laughed since becoming a slave. The next morning Zeppelin was in an uproar, as both trade union leaders Beret and Porky were found dead. The culprit is unknown as the guards had their memories wiped, and their mixed-up testimonies made it unsolvable. Two weeks later in a dungeon, we see Ceylon casting a spell on the undead, and Cerise going to town too. Reef stands there complimenting them while taking negative damage, and he wonders how long Ceylon's been fighting for since he's so skilled. And if he keeps improving he'll become even more powerful than St. Ellen, he wonders why he wasn't famous in his past life. He asks Ceylon if he's injured. Ceylon says these mobs are stronger than the ones in Paulton, he says they are easier since it's a back route. We learn they made it to the Graeme Kingdom, and are in the Seedlard Mountains. In the forgotten ruins of Elusion. As he needs to be here for his magical prowess. They come across some doors, and Ceylon says they'll need a mage to open it, and this is why he suggested they have a mage. Reef says he'll handle it, and Ceylon is surprised he can use magic. Reef tells him he used to be a mage, Ceylon says it's unfair that he's so good at martial arts and he's also smart enough for magic. Then asks what he's doing, since he shouldn't need much mana for a third circle spell. Reef is trying his best, and finally begins to do something and opens the door. Ceylon says that took 13 minutes and never tell anyone he's a mage again. Reef took critical damage, he says he needs Lucian's voice soon he can't stand being this bad at magic. As they enter he's surprised to see it's empty, and sees there's only an old bone left behind. They leave and he's bummed out, Ceylon says they can't always be the first. And he realizes this means the future has changed, since he's the one who found the dungeon 17 years from now. Ceylon says to cheer up, they found something pretty great. Cerise activates it, 
and we learn it shoots arrows made of mana and its effectiveness is based on the wielder's concentration. And it looks like a normal stick, but it's a branch from the tree of life Elfenheim. We see her absolutely obliterate a tree, and Silan asks how it feels. She says it's great. Silan then asks how he knew it was an artifact, and of course it's because of his past life. But he's still disappointed since there isn't a relic that can replace Illusion's voice. Since it was the only one to help replace his power. They stumble across a place called Chalan Village. They go down and start feasting, a girl asks if the food is enough, and how the guests before all complained about the dishes. Silan asks who, and she says a noble knight family who came here to explore the ruins. He tries to pay her for info, but she says she'll tell him regardless. And that Viscount Kelberin came with an exploration team, and there was a knight in gold too. He was really nice to her, he recognizes it as the Tennis family. And plot convenience ensues, and we see a man, thanking someone named Eusus. Saying it's an honor to witness his skills. Eusus says don't worry Kelberin the treasures will be his as promised. At what is presumably the Kelberin castle, we see the Count saying it's an honor to fight alongside him, and he doesn't care for the relics. Eusus asks what he's doing with the Adamant and Arishalem, the Count laughs saying he's making them weapons. Eusus takes a sip saying as expected of the Count. He says it's nothing, then introduces him to his daughters. He says he knows he's married, but he thought it'd be good to have them acquainted. Eusus apologizes, saying he doesn't intend to get close to women other than his wife. The Count then tries to ask about his younger sibling, but we hear glass shatter and Eusus says he has no younger sibling. The Count apologizes to him, then we hear screaming and a man runs in saying a demon appeared from one of the relics. And that it's Sefiatan, we see it's like a center demon thing and the soldiers are struggling. Eusus asks if there was a summoning artifact in the list, then realizes what it means and says stupid bastard. Then we see someone walking towards Sefiatan, and as he gets closer he drops his shield and begins to reach for his sword. The mages begin to prepare spells, and launch all sorts of attacks at the demon, walling it off with ice. The man gets closer and raises his sword, one of the men asks Russ what he's doing, but Russ just says he won't allow such a sight in front of the tennis sword. He leaps in screaming at it, and slices the demon, he manages to draw some blood. Then we say the demon instantly swings down at him, and breaks his sword, the attack launches him backward. And we see him struggle to lean up, then two bright yellow slashes fly overhead. And explodes on the monster's chest, we hear Yusus saying to leave the foolish ones and maintain a net, turns out Russ is his brother. He angrily glares at Russ, and says he is not his brother, and to stop calling him as such. Russ looks sad, and Yusus says Sefiatan is a demon that Aura users cannot fight. And slings his big ass sword to the floor, he lifts it again and begins to imbue Aura into it. He says open your eyes Eldrad, and his sword begins to open apart, and pieces of the sword begin to coat his body, and turns him into a fully golden suit. He says he's ready, then it jumps to night time and Reef asking about the golden knight. Silan says he's quite famous, and Reef says he's from the mountains. Silan says that he's one of the strongest swordsmen in the continent, and among the Aura users. Reef asks Cerise if she's heard of him too, she says yes. Then he says her pajamas look good, asking how they feel. She says they're good. Silan goes back to the subject of Usus, saying how can you compare a magic swordsman to an Aura user, since it'll be dependent on the magic tool. Reef says that Eldrad is the strongest magic armor in their current age, but being proficient in it is another issue. We learn that it's made out of a material called True Gold Eldril, and the armor has been passed through the Tennis County for generations. And the user is always called the Golden Knight, and it allows them to fight on Pa with an Aura user. Of course that's only if they can use it properly, we see Yusus slice some of the demon, and goes for a follow-up attack. He says to wake up again, and uses an 8th circle spell called Material Destruction. Reef says that just because it's a good tool, it doesn't mean it's absolutely strong. Silan says he's surprised Reef thinks so highly of magic swordsmen, since Aura users don't generally like them. He says that's because the tennis army is more profound than most sword techniques, Yusus prepares for another attack, and we learn that the tennis family seems to have lost their sword techniques, and rely on their tools. Yusus blows a hole through the demon, and goes for another follow-up with Hella Fireballs. Reef makes a good point that even if they trained in swordsmanship, there's no guarantee they'd have an aura user, so this is a much better choice. He uses the fireballs and creates a fiery explosion, then begins to instantly swap to an icy magic instead. He yells to disappear, then slashes violently cutting the Dermon up. The soldiers watch as the demon is defeated, and Russ looks out of it. 
Yusus stands there as its corpse begins to disintegrate. Reef wonders if he'll be able to beat the Golden Knight, Silant asks if he's planning to fight him, and Reef says he needs the artifact. Silant asks if he's planning to steal, saying he worked with him in Chatton because he was right. But the Count explored the ruins himself so the item is his, and him taking the artifact would be stealing. He says he's right, and wonders how to persuade him. He then says he's already mentioned how he's a part of Jim Unbreakable right, Silan says yes. Turns out he lies to her, saying that Gerard placed the artifact in the ruins so he could retrieve it. And Silan believes it. But asks why Gerard didn't touch the other artifacts, he says it's so there would be rewards for him to grab. Then says to think about it, how'd he have known about the bone without being told about it before? Silan totally buys into it, and Reef apologizes saying it's not a complete lie. Silan says it all makes sense, Reef looks guilty as hell. Silan says if he really needs it, then there must be another option than stealing. A man then tells Yusus he did good, the man's name is Lot and Yusus says to clean it all up. And he tells Russ to get a grip of himself, saying he's not a swordsman of tennis. Russ says he is regardless of what he thinks. The next day we see a sword swinging, and Russ is training early in the morning. He is determined, some other guys come up asking why he pulled such a dumb stunt yesterday. He says he just wanted to kill the demon. The men asks why he did that, saying the orders were to wait for the captain. He says he's also a swordsman of tennis, and if they have a problem to duel him and he'll fight them. They call him a mongrel and continue walking. Russ is strong, but he only knows how to swing his sword downward, and the breathing technique that accompanies it. And a true master of the sword can recognize how masterful his slash is, but the rest of his skills are hot dog water. The house of tennis has forgotten true swordsmanship, and while they had a legacy for sword techniques he never got to learn them. Since he's a bastard child, he was only passed down the downward slash, and his father told him it's a path towards aura, and he might be able to one day figure out how to connect it to the other moves. Russ strived every day to not let his father's expectations down, while everyone else forgot the sword art and mocked it. He didn't care. Eusus wonders why he trained so hard, saying the other sword paths have already been forgotten and calls him a fool, but as he watches Russ struggle he says the bastard is a genius. That night we see Reef in a mask running through the woods. He says he can't believe he's doing this, and wonders why the castle is so damn big, but says it's the word of dwarves. He quickly takes the guards out. We see other guards talking wondering why they are on patrol, saying nobody would be dumb enough to invade with Yusus here. Then one of them hears something, the man says it must have been the wind, and we see Reef above them. After they leave he hops down, he then sees guards wearing a different uniform saying they must be the tennis knights. He quickly hits one, and knocks him out, and before the other can scream he peacefully talks to him. He gets to a door, saying this is it. But he runs into a problem with the security spell, he says the magical barrier must be somewhere around here. Then finds a rock laying on the floor that has engravings on it, and crushes it in his hand. He enters the storeroom, he finds a lot of artifacts and wonders who categorize them. Then he spots Lucian's voice, after all of his Metal Gear Solid gameplay he steps on a stupid wire, then looks over to see it ringing an alarm bell. How does this happen? The Count wakes up to the bell, and the entire castle goes on alert. Reef says he should leave robbing to thieves, he quickly takes out some of the guards. Lot appears with the group saying to stand their ground, he orders the mages to attack. They launch fireballs towards Reef. he grabs a guard and says sorry about this. Then uses the dude as a human shield, they ask how he can be so evil, and Reef thinks he only did it because the guy's armor had a blessing on it. They launch arrows at him, but they just bounce off him, others are like chains that stick to him. He realizes they were just trying to restrain his movement, and says not bad. They start to prepare the next spell, and he says damn they are going all out. A shield is thrown to the floor, and Russ yells saying to face his sword. Lot tells Russ not to go, even Reef wonders what he's doing. Russ charges in and goes to swing at him. Lot tells him not to break formation, he ignores him and runs through the guards. Reef says he doesn't recall that name, but his movements and breathing all look ordinary, but he can tell that his swing is exceptional. He swings down at Reef, but he uses some of his aura and catches the blade with a chain. Russ realizes he's goofed, then Reef hits him in the side and he goes tumbling. Reef says what the hell, wondering why his attack was so powerful, but he couldn't dodge a simple hit. Then we hear Yusus and he launches attacks towards Reef. He's in his golden armor already, and Yusus says his skills are too high for a trespasser. Reef says he has his reasons. 
Yusus says they can chat later, Reef charges in since the gym unbreakable motto is to attack first. Yusus matches him, and they both get hella close to each other and are surprised they charged at one another, they both attack but dodge each other. Then they both jump backwards to create distance, Yusus starts to do something, and the soldiers wonder what the hell is going on. And they both awkwardly say Veilp that didn't work. Yusus sends out a shadow attack, Reef dodges it saying he recognizes it, and he stirs up dust to break the spell. Yusus wonders how he knows the spell's weakness, and says he's proficient in countering magic. Reef says he just knows most of them, then dodges Yusus's swing, they start to run around and Reef continues dodging each attack. Then counter attacks with a punch to the chest, Yusus says shit that actually hurt, and casts more spells. They fly at Reef, but he dodges. Yusus says awaken Eldrin, and notices Reef dodges, and changes the direction of the attack towards Reef. Who says he might get clapped at this rate? If you've watched till the end comment, T-Rex, to let me know. Subscribe for more videos like this, leave a like or a comment to help the channel out. Thanks for watching.